Hello friends, hello subscribers, hello interior weather and wilderness watchers, hello most especially to the air cadets of 768 Jet Ranger Squadron in Quinnell. This video is for you, it's lesson two in our series and it's about learning the formation of clouds. This is actually pretty exciting stuff, it's fun. It is important for cadets to know how clouds form. It will enhance their knowledge of meteorology and their ability to predict the weather. One of my things is I can read clouds like a book. I mean, uh, there's been so many days when I'm working out in the wilderness. And, you know, I get out there early in the morning and I see these tiny little speckles and maybe see these little mare's tails at the upper level. And I start seeing that stuff in the Cirrus. Did you know that Cirrus clouds also form on other planets? Cirrus stratus and thinking, oh, okay, it's going to happen today. And even when the sky gets clearer, I'm not fooled because I know what's going on in that upper level. That instability is up there. And then as I watch the clouds developing through the day, I start seeing these small cumulus clouds. And then maybe some of them start to form to the next guy next to them. And then they start to grow a little taller. And then they start growing taller. And they start drinking from the ground. <laughs> Sucking up all the moisture you can find from trees, from the face of rocks, from roadways, from lakes, from rivers, from the ground itself. <sighs> sucking. That dryness is sucking it. And eventually it's building bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it punches through the cap at the top and it starts to become a thunderstorm. This is what happens. And I always seem to know what's happening. And people like say, how did you know it came from nowhere, man? And no, it didn't come from nowhere. The formation of that storm was an entire process. And it was a logical one, a consistent one that happens in sort of different ways, but generally much the same every time. Every storm is a little different and has its own sort of storm genesis, how it forms. But the process is more or less, sometimes it's a clash of fronts that uh, triggers storms. Sometimes it's upper level instability, you know, and then ground heating. There's different things that can kind of cause them, but basically more or less it's always the same. The hot and dry meets the cool and damp. And whammo! And when you get enough of this with that upper level winds, you know, the stuff's going this way down here, but the upper level winds going this way, and you start getting enough of that, and the storm gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger, and then what happens? It starts to spin. Storm starts to spin. And what comes out of it is a tornado! True stories. Seen it. Clouds are classified based on formation and height. There are two main types of cloud formations. The first one is cumulus, and the second is stratus. Cumulus clouds are formed by air that is unstable. They are cottony or puffy, and are seen mostly during warmer seasons. Cumulus clouds may develop into storm clouds. They have flat bases and are described as puffy or cotton-like. Their name comes from the Latin word cumulo, which means heap or pile. Cumulus clouds are low-level clouds, generally 2,000 meters in altitude, Cumulus clouds are often precursors of other types of clouds, such as cumulonimbus, the thunderstorm cloud, when influenced by weather factors such as instability, moisture, and temperature gradient. Cumulus clouds can be formed from water vapor, supercool water droplets, or ice crystals, depending on the, the ambient temperature. They come in many distinct subforms and generally cool the earth by reflecting the incoming solar radiation. The other type is stratus clouds. Stratus clouds are formed in air that is stable. They are flat and can be seen year round, but are associated with colder temperatures. Stratus clouds are low level clouds characterized by horizontal layering with a uniform base, as opposed to convective or cumuliform clouds that are formed by rising thermals, rising warm air. The term stratus describes flat, hazy, featureless clouds at low altitudes, varying in color from dark gray to nearly white. The word stratus comes from a Latin prefix meaning layer. You can also find this in geology, stratigraphic layering. Stratus clouds may produce light drizzle or small amounts of snow. They are essentially above ground fog formed either through the lifting of morning fog or through cold air moving at low altitudes over a region. Some call these clouds high fog. While light rain may fall, this cloud does not indicate much meteorological precipitation. Clouds are classified by their height above ground level. There are several classifications, which are low clouds. The bases of low clouds range from the surface height of 6,500 feet air to ground level. 
Low clouds are composed of water droplets and sometimes ice crystals. Low clouds use the word stratus as either a prefix, for example stratocumulus, or a suffix, nimbostratus. Middle clouds. Middle clouds range from 6,500 feet or so to 23,000 feet above ground level. They are composed of ice crystals or water droplets, which may be at temperatures above zero degrees Celsius. Middle clouds use the prefix alto. A good example is alto cumulus. Then there's high clouds. The bases of high clouds range from 16,500 feet to 45,000 feet, with an average of 25,000 feet in the temperate regions of the Earth. High clouds are composed of ice crystals. High clouds use the prefix cirrus or cirro, for example, cirrocumulus. So strata, stratus, alto, and cirro. You can remember alto as middle because it's kind of like the vocal range. Say a woman who has a very low voice is considered an alto. Maybe you could call them tenor clouds because a, a man with high voice is tenor, right? Then we have clouds of vertical development. The base of these clouds may be as low as 1,500 feet above ground level and may rise as high as the lower reaches of the stratosphere. They may appear as isolated clouds or may be seen embedded in layers of clouds. Clouds of vertical development are associated with thunderstorms and other phenomena which occur during summer months. So let's go through this chart and let's look at all the cloud types. First we have the cirrus, the high cloud, Want to see what my weather was doing today? Check out these long, thin, wispy clouds. They tell me that change is about to happen. What's going on? I'm looking basically south right now. West of us out to sea is a big low pressure ball. So imagine it like this. Somewhere out here is this big low pressure and he's spinning. And then somewhere out here is high pressure and as he's bringing clouds up, they're meeting resistance from the high pressure lines, forcing things to be skinny. And then if you imagine this big bunch of weather out there, and then you have jet stream high level winds are carrying that moisture a long ways out into the, that's the cirrus. It's being carried way out. And we see it as these cirrus clouds like, oh, look at those beautiful little clouds and don't realize they're actually attached to something way out here. Well, what does it say here? The Science Corner by Ted Funk, Science and Operations Officer, weather.gov. So this is American, but nonetheless, we see here cirrus clouds, cirrostratus clouds, cirrocumulus clouds, and altostratus clouds, and then altocumulus clouds. These are high level clouds. The high level clouds occur above 20,000 feet. Due to cold tropospheric temperatures at these levels, the clouds primarily are composed of ice crystals and appear thin, streaky, and white. The three main types of high clouds are cirrus, cirrostratus, and cirrocumulus. Cirrus clouds are wispy, feathery, and composed entirely of ice crystals. They are often the first sign of an approaching warm front or upper level jet streak. Unlike cirrus, cirrostratus clouds form more of a widespread veil-like layer. When sunlight or moonlight passes through the hexagonal shaped ice crystals of cirrostratus clouds, the light is dispersed or refracted in such a way that a familiar ring or halo may form. As a warm front approaches, cirrus clouds tend to thicken into cirrostratus. Finally, cirrocumulus clouds are layered clouds permeated with small cumuliform lumpiness. They may also line up in streets or rows of clouds across the skies, denoting localized areas of ascent and descent. So they are a harbinger of change. We know that change is coming. Here, look at over your trusty windy.com. Where are the clouds? Well, there's some up north of Prince George. We see that low pressures out here. We see high pressures up here. We got these different pressure lines. Well, we don't see much cloud though. Oh, well, high clouds, lots of high cloud. And where's medium cloud? Okay, so we're looking at mostly high cl cloud over us in the Caribbean today. And where's this high cloud going? Pushing southward. Southwesterly, I suppose. You see that big low squeezing forward and pushing in to British Columbia in the north, where there's going to be snow on Friday. And that's going to spread into the interior through the weekend. So as that low pressure spins up counterclockwise over on the continental side in Alberta, say, we have high pressure and it's spinning clockwise. So the two of them are squeezing the clouds into long thin strips. These are harbingers of change. That tells me that uh, snowy weather is coming into the north. It's uh, not even minus five right now, nice day. Cirrus clouds usually move across the sky from west to east. They generally indicate pleasant weather. 
the strands of clouds sometimes appear in tufts of a distinctive form referred to by the common name of mare's tails. They can form from the outflow of tropical cyclones and from the anvils of cumulonimbus clouds. Cirrus clouds also arrive in advance of those storms associated frontal systems. It's an indicator of a coming deterioration in weather conditions. Maybe they indicate the arrival of precipitation. They generally indicate that you are seeing good weather right now. If the upper level winds, the jet stream, is catching these cirrus clouds, they can grow long enough to stretch across entire continents while remaining just a few kilometers deep. They can help produce sun dogs and halos. Cirrus clouds raise the temperature due to heat released as water vapor freezes. When they become thick enough, they may form a sheet of high cloud called cirrostratus. Rising air at high altitudes can also create cirrocumulus with patterns of small cloud tufts containing droplets of super cool water. Did you know that cirrus clouds form on other planets too? They've been seen on Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and even on Titan. Oh yeah, Neptune and uh, Uranus too. So cirrocumulus, they're in the high cloud family. They appear as small round white puffs. The small ripples in the cirrocumulus sometimes resemble the scales of a fish. A sky with cirrocumulus clouds is sometimes referred to as a mackerel sky. They're one of the three main types of high altitude tropospheric clouds. So clouds found in the bottom 50,000 feet, say. The other two being cirrus and cirrostratus. They usually occur at an altitude of 5 to 12 kilometers, 16,000 to 39,000 feet. The liquid moisture is in a supercooled state. Ice crystals. Each little cirrocumulus cloud is referred to as a cloudlet. In the middle we have altocumulus. They appear as gray puffy masses, sometimes in parallel waves or bands. The appearance of these clouds on a warm, humid summer morning means thunderstorms will occur in the late afternoon. Altocumulus clouds sign convection, rising air. Altocumulus is commonly found between warm and cold fronts in a depression, although this is sometimes hidden by lower clouds. Towering altocumulus, also known as altocumulus castellanus, frequently signals the development of thunderstorms later in the day as it shows instability and convection in the middle layers of the troposphere, the lower 50,000 feet. This is the area where towering cumulus clouds can be turned into cumulonimbus. It is therefore one of three warning clouds often recorded by aviation industry, the other two being towering cumulus and cumulonimbus. Altocumulus generally forms at about 2,000 meters, so 6,600 feet and may rise to 20,000 feet above the ground level. Satellite photography has revealed that the two types of clouds can create formations that stretch for thousands of miles. Next you have the altostratus in the middle. It's a gray or blue layer that typically covers the entire sky. In the thinner areas of the cloud, the sun may be dimly visible as a round disk. This cloud appears lighter than stratus clouds. So altostratus is a middle cloud. It's characterized by uniform gray or bluish green sheet layers. It is lighter in color than nimbostratus and high cirrostratus. Altostratus is formed by the lifting of a large, mostly stable air mass that causes invisible water to condense into cloud. It can produce light precipitation, often in the form of virga. If the precipitation increases in persistence and intensity, the altostratus cloud may thicken into nimbostratus. Mostly it takes the form of a featureless sheet of cloud, but can be wavy, also known as undulatus, as a result of wind shear through the cloud. It can also be fragmented, fibratus, with clear sky visible, which often precedes the approach of a weakened upper level front. Now we get to the low clouds, stratus. These are uniform gray layer clouds that often cover the entire skies. They resemble fog that does not reach the ground. Usually no precipitation falls from stratus clouds, but sometimes they may drizzle. Then you have nimbostratus, dark gray layer clouds associated with continuously falling rain or snow. They often produce precipitation that is light to moderate. They are mostly uniform, often dark gray. They come before continuous rain or snow or sleet, but they don't bring lightning or thunder. It's a low base cloud 
It actually forms most commonly in the middle layer of the troposphere and then spreads vertically into the low and high levels. Nimbostratus usually produces precipitation over a wide area. Nimbostratus can have a thickness of 2,000 to 4,000 meters. It's found near the surface in the low levels to about 3,000 meters, almost 10,000 feet. Next you have stratocumulus. This is a series of rounded masses that form a layer cloud. This type of cloud is usually thin enough for the sky to be seen through breaks. Stratocumulus are characterized by large, dark, rounded masses, usually in groups, lines, or waves. They are usually below 2,000 meters. Most often, stratocumulus produces no precipitation, and if they do, it's very light. Dull weather is a common expression used for overcast stratocumulus days, which either occur between a warm front and a cold front in a depression, or in a high area of pressure. In the latter case, sometimes persisting over a specific area for several days. On drier areas, they dissipate quickly. The stratocumulus breaks up under the sun's heat and often reforms again by evening as the heat of the sun decreases. And then we get to the fun clouds. Cumulus, vertical development clouds. They're puffy, which are thick, round, and lumpy. They sometimes look like pieces of floating cotton. We spoke about them earlier. They usually have flat bases and round tops. And then the real fun one, the one I like to chase, the cumulonimbus cloud, vertical development cloud. These are thunderstorm clouds that form if cumulus clouds continue to build. Violent vertical air currents, hail, lightning, and thunder are associated with the cumulonimbus cloud, and also tornadoes. Numerous aviation accidents have occurred in the vicinity of thunderstorms. Turbulence can be extreme enough inside a cumulonimbus cloud to tear an aircraft into pieces. However, this kind of accident is pretty rare. Moreover, the turbulence under a thunderstorm can be non-existent and usually no more than moderate. Most thunderstorm-related crashes occur due to a stall close to the ground. Pilots sometimes get caught by surprise by thunderstorm-induced wind shifts. Aircraft damage caused by thunderstorms is rarely in the form of structural failure due to turbulence, but is typically less severe, and the consequence of secondary effects of thunderstorms, denting by hail, Cumulonimbus clouds are extremely dangerous to air traffic, and it's recommended to avoid them as much as possible. They can be insidious. Inattentive pilots can end up in a very dangerous situation while flying in apparently very calm air. However, there's different kinds of severity for thunderstorms. There's not a whole lot of difference between a small rain shower or a small thunderstorm with a few thunderclaps. For this reason, glider pilots could exploit rising air columns under a thunderstorm without recognizing the situation. Instead of thinking the rising air was due to a more benign variety of cumulus. However, forecasting thunderstorm severity isn't a, you know, it's not an exact science. In numerous occasions, pilots have been trapped by underestimating the severity of thunderstorms that suddenly strengthened their dense, towering vertical clouds. They form from water vapor carried by powerful upward air currents. During a storm, these clouds may be referred to as thunderheads. Cumulonimbus clouds can form alone or in clusters or along cold fronts or squall lines, very long lines of storms. These clouds are capable of producing lightning and other dangerous severe weather like hailstones and tornadoes. They may further develop into a supercell thunderstorm. A supercell is a thunderstorm with the presence of mesocyclonic behavior. This is deep, persistently rotating updrafts. For this reason, these storms are sometimes referred to as rotating thunderstorms. Of the four classes of thunderstorms, you have supercell, squall line, multi-cell storms, and single-cell storms. Supercell storms are overall least common, but have the potential to be the most severe. Most often, they're on their own, isolated from other storms. They can dominate local weather, though, for 32 kilometers away. They can last two to four hours. Some are classic regular old supercell storms, referred to as normal precipitation level. Some are low precipitation storms, LP, and some are high precipitation storms, HP. LP supercells are found in climates that are most arid, such as the high plains of the United States. HP supercells are more often found in moist climates. They can occur anywhere in the world under the right existing weather conditions but they're most common in the Great Plains of the United States or the Prairie Provinces of Canada. The dome feature at the top of the storm 
It's where the strongest updraft location is in the anvil in a storm. It's the result of powerful updrafts, powerful enough to break through the upper levels of the troposphere and into the stratosphere. An observer at ground level close to the storm may be unable to see the overshooting top because the anvil blocks the sight of this feature. The overshooting is visible from satellite images as a bubbling amidst the otherwise smooth upper surface of the anvil cloud. The anvil forms when the storm's updraft collides with the tropopause. It has nowhere to go due to the laws of fluid dynamics. That's specifically pressure, humidity, and density. The anvil is very cold and virtually precipitation free, even though Virga can be seen falling. Since there's so little moisture in the anvil, winds can move freely. The clouds take on their own anvil shape when the rising air reaches 15,000 meters, 50,000 feet. Maybe that's a little lower in BC. The anvil's distinguishing feature is that it juts out in front of the storm like a shelf. In some cases, it can even shear backwards. That's called a back sheared anvil, another sign of very, very strong updrafts. The stronger the updraft, the stronger the storm. At the base of the supercells where the wall cloud might form. Wall clouds form when rain cooled air from the downdraft is pulled into the updraft. This wet, cold air quickly saturates as it's lifted by the updraft, forming a cloud that seems to descend from the precipitation free base. Wall clouds are common and not exclusive to supercells. A small percentage only produce tornadoes. But if a storm does produce a tornado, it usually exhibits this wall cloud for more than 10 minutes. Now it's time for your questions. So don't be afraid to hit pause after I say the question. Take your time and write down the answers. At the end of the video, we'll review all the questions and I'll give you the answers. I want you to learn the answers correctly, not uh, remember what it was you wrote down wrong. But I want you to try writing something down. All right, cadets? So how are clouds classified? There's two things. How are they classified? Question number two was, what are the two types of cloud formations? And question three was, what are the four categories of cloud height? Air stability. At the surface, the normal flow of air is horizontal. Disturbances may occur, which will cause vertical currents of air to develop. This can be caused by a change in temperature. If the air that is displaced resists the change, then it's said to be stable. If it does not resist the change, it's unstable. When air rises, it expands and cools. Stable air. If a mass of rising air is cooler than the air it comes to, into contact with, then it will sink back to its original position. Stable air may have the following effects on flight characteristics. Poor low-level visibility, such as fog, stratus-type cloud, steady precipitation, steady winds, which can change greatly with height, and smooth flying conditions. Unstable air, however, if a mass of rising air is warmer than the new air around it, the air will continue to rise. Unstable air may have the following effects on flight characteristics. Good visibility, except if there's precipitation. Cumulus cloud types. Showery precipitation. Gusty winds. And moderate to severe turbulence. So your questions. What may create vertical currents? What is stable air? What is unstable air? It was snowing all morning, but now we have these little puffy cumuliform clouds. Don't worry, none of this is going to be on the test necessarily because I thought this would uh, help make sense of things maybe for you. So here's some puffy little cumulus clouds. It snowed all morning and it was a little bit warmer. So I can feel the temperature dropping a little bit. And with these little puffy cumulus clouds, well, that's some slight convection. So what's happening is a little cold front is moving through now for the afternoon. It's sinking, the cold air is sinking and the warm air is rising.
and so we're getting just some weak convection. When it comes to low clouds, there's really two things that I look for. Is it convective or not? I can tell you a lot about what's going on based on that. So I always have this sort of way, even in a small pocket in the forest, I can get up and have a look. And these clouds will tell me what's happening. What I also know though, is that the snow isn't done. The question is how much will we get here tomorrow? The orographic lift of the mountains pushes the weather up and over. It kind of sails over the Chilcotin and Caribou, and then it likes to hit the upslope side of the Caribou Mountains, say Wells, Barkerville, uh, Yanks Peak, and that's why we get so much crazy snow there. Whereas here, often the snow and weather tends to go right over us. However, enough, we're at 1400 meters where I'm standing right now, so that's high enough up above sea level, it will attract snowfall sometimes anyway. So there's about a meter of snow beneath my feet right now. So right now we had that low pressure this morning, that low density air, and that, uh, brought snow and now some high pressure air is moving through. So often during storm chasing days in the summer when it's thunderstormy, one of the most important things to me is that convection process. I'm looking at these low clouds and I'm trying to see if there's a change in their behavior. At what point of the day does that change start? So maybe at 11 in the morning I see, a bunch, or maybe at uh, seven in the morning I see a bunch of speckles in the sky and I think, oh, in instability in the upper atmosphere. Interesting. There's winds going different direction above us than there is where we are right here on the ground. And that tells me there's some conflict going on. And then I'll start seeing the little individual cumulus clouds. And I say, okay, that convection's there. Now it's 9.30 in the morning. Well, then by 11, I start seeing uh, them forming together and growing taller. I know what a full-grown developing thunderstorm looks like and how it behaves. So, but the rate of convection, the rate of its growth, and the strength of its growth and speed of it, you know, I can tell how strong of a storm am I going to get. If it's going to reach a real high potential by 3 in the afternoon, I know it's going to be, if it's going to convect that fast, that by mid-afternoon it's going to be a storm, I can guess how strong that storm will be often. And if it's going to wait until 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night, maybe it'll be weaker it won't have that same energy driving it so it's storm time of the day is often four o'clock to 7 p.m and you'll notice this often doesn't mean thunderstorms don't happen during the height of summer and the middle of the night and things like that or in the morning even so there's our puffy little cumulus clouds weak convection whatever goes up must come down so remember that in the summertime the faster a storm is growing up the harder she's going to come down somewhere that's why you don't want to be in the forest when the lightning starts lightning likes to go to trees don't be near trees. Trees explode and worse, you might get electrocuted, but also uh, the gust fronts or sometimes the uh, the wind events at the back of the storm can be very strong and knock trees down and you do not want to be around when the trees all start coming down. So now it's later in the day, maybe three hours since I last talked. It's much colder now than it was and we see that the cumulus behavior has changed to the south of us, you can still see some cloud, but to the north, we have an Arctic air mass coming in and that's keeping things colder, right? So you've got like kind of weak gravity waves. The clouds have sort of stretched themselves out. Things are evening out. The cold air is taking over and convection has stopped. There's no more rising warm air really. Uh, maybe a tiny bit, but more or less the story right now is cold moving in and that's how I can see it. It's the next day. The winds are picking up, temperatures warmed up some. These winds suggest to me that a snowstorm is almost here. We'll probably see snow starting to fall pretty soon. At the front of a system, such as a thunderstorm system or a big uh, low pressure system, you can generally expect its arrival to begin with winds. A gust front of some sort along the, the front of the line. Oh no, I just threw my glove away. Into the snow, my mitten. No! No! Oh! Getting my mitten wet. I guess in the next hour we'll find out if I am right. Let's move on to section three now. Explaining lifting agents. Lifting agents, cool man. Rising currents of air may affect weather conditions. There are five conditions that provide the lift required to initiate rising currents of air. The first is convection. The air is heated through contact with the Earth's surface. As the sun heats the surface of the Earth, the air in contact with the surface warms up. It rises and expands. Convection may also occur when air moves over a warmer surface and is heated by advection. So convection, you have your moist upward flowing air currents 
and these are causing a cloud to form. And this is happening because of that moisture is being sucked out of the ground, the trees, the land, the water. Then you have dry convection on the other surface. Then you have the warm surface, which is land or water, and that's feeding that moisture up. So what's convection? It's warm air rises and then cool air sinks. Orographic lift occurs when a sloping terrain forces the air upwards. So an air mass is forced from a lower elevation to a higher elevation as it moves over rising terrain. As the air mass gains altitude, it quickly cools down. This can raise the relative humidity to 100% and create clouds. Under the right condition, this can create precipitation. You see this in wells all the time. It's sunny in Quesnel and it's snowing in wells. Then we have frontal lift. This is when different air masses meet. The warmer air is forced upwards by the denser cold air. This process may be exaggerated if the warm air mass becomes unstable. So cold air is sinking underneath and it's forcing warm air to rise even faster than it wants to. Then you have mechanical turbulence. Air is moving over the ground. It may be affected by terrain that is not as pronounced as mountains. This can be forests, buildings, large ditches and quarries. They affect the air through friction. This friction causes little eddies, which are usually confined to the first few thousand feet of the troposphere. This process may be exaggerated if the air mass becomes or is already unstable. So you see I have a runway here that's got heat coming off of it. There'd actually be more arrows here because of that. The, there'd be more convection, more rising heat. And you see the aerodromes, different little wind eddies that are caused by wind hitting different objects. Then you have convergence. In a low pressure system, the wind blows toward the center of the system. The excess air that collects here is forced upwards into the higher altitudes. A convergence zone in meteorology is a region in the atmosphere where two prevailing flows meet and interact. This usually results in distinctive weather conditions. This causes mass accumulation that eventually leads to vertical movement and the formation of clouds and precipitation. Large scale convergence is called synoptic scale convergence. It's associated with weather systems such as baroclinic troughs, low pressure areas, and cyclones. Low, these large scale convergence zones form over the equator. Take for example the intratropical convergence zone. The opposite of convergence is divergence. Question 1. Explain how convection as a source of lift occurs. Question 2. Explain orographic lift. Question 3. Explain frontal lift. Section 4. Describe cloud formation. Clouds are formed in two different ways. Either the temperature drops to the saturation point of the air, or the temperature is constant but the amount of water in the air increases. Warmer air holds more moisture. Cold, cold air holds virtually none. This is referred to as the humid X value. How much moisture can a temperature hold and how much is actually there? Relating lifting agents to air stability. Each of the lifting agents described have an effect on or is affected by air stability. Convection, for example, is normally associated with unstable air since heat causes the convection and is also a source of instability in the air. Another example would be orographic lift, which is usually associated with stable air. After the air has been forced up by the terrain, it cools and becomes dense. The effect is similar to positive stability in an airplane. Relating air stability to types of cloud formation. Air stability will have a direct effect on cloud formation. Clouds created in stable air will form as a stratus type cloud. Clouds formed in unstable air will form as cumulus type clouds. And here are your questions for section number four. What are the two ways in which clouds form? Question two, what is orographic lift? Question two, how does orographic lift relate to air stability? Question number three, what clouds will form in stable air?
And here are your final questions. The end of lesson questions. There's three of them. What are the two types of cloud formation? Define unstable air. Question three. What kind of cloud will form an unstable air? Let's review the questions and answers now. Question one from section one was, how are clouds classified? They're classified by type of formation and height. Question two, what are the two types of cloud formations? If you said cumulus and stratus, then you said what they want you to say. Question three was, what are the four categories of cloud height? Low clouds, middle clouds, high clouds, and clouds of vertical development. Low cloud, middle cloud, high cloud, and vertical development. Question one from section two. What may create vertical air currents? The answer is a change in temperature. Question two, what is stable air? When a mass of air is cooler than the air it comes into, it will sink. Question three, what is unstable air? When a mass of warm air is rising and is warmer than the air it comes into contact with, it will keep rising. Section three questions. Question one, explain how convection as a source of lift occurs. Convection is caused by the heating of air that is in contact with the earth. Question two, explain orographic lift. Orographic lift occurs when sloping terrain forces air upwards. Question three, explain frontal lift. When different air masses meet, the warm air is forced upward by the cold air. This can be exaggerated if the air is unstable. Section four, question number one. What are the two types of ways in which clouds are formed? Either the temperature drops to the saturation point of the air or the temperature is constant but the amount of air in the water increases. Question two, how does orographic lift relate to air stability? After the air has been forced up by the terrain, it cools and becomes dense. The effect is similar to positive stability in an airplane. What type of cloud will form in stable air? That's question three. Clouds formed in stable air will create stratus type clouds. Final questions were, what are the two types of cloud formation? We said cumulus and stratus. Define unstable air. When a mass of rising air is warmer than the new air around it, then the air mass will continue to rise. Question three, what type of cloud will form in unstable air? Clouds created in unstable air will form as cumulus type clouds. Well, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. That's enough for me. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you think about it. And good luck in your studies, everybody. Bye for now.